The following message is a production of Tony Broom Ministries. Everybody likes to have a story with a good ending. We're talking about the story with a good ending. Some people even, they take a book and they'll just flip to the back of it and see how it comes out. Well, I've read the back of the book and we win. We have a story with a good ending. Hallelujah. Our scripture comes from the book of Obadiah. Obadiah just has one chapter. He's known as one of the minor prophets. They're called the minor prophets not because their message is minor, but they're in the section called the minor prophets. I like to refer to them as the minor prophets with a major message. Obadiah has one chapter, and our scriptures today are verses 17 and 21. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. And the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. This story has a good ending. It tells us that things are going to come out good at the end. Going to come out all right. That's good to know. Because you look around in today's society, things look kind of bleak. Things look uncertain. We don't even know about what the government... They don't know which ends up, it seems like. They don't know what's going on, how to fix every, how to fix this and how to fix that. They'd rather stay in deadlock and let the country fall apart. And to get together and act like you've got some common sense and work things out. Sanctify that thing like the Beatles said. We can work it out. We can work it out. Well, somebody needs to start working it out then. <laughs> Obadiah means the servant of the Lord. That's a good name to have. It has B-A-D in there. Oh, bad, I uh. But he wasn't too bad after all because he was a servant of the Lord. He was God's servant to bring His message to His people. And the message that he brought was... Well, it was kind of a disturbing message. And that's the way God's Word is now. It's according on what side of the fence you're on is how God's Word will strike you. You know, if you're on the wrong side of the fence, that is, if you're not right with God, the Word's going to rub you the wrong way. But if you're right with God, the Word's going to do you good. So it's according on what, whose camp you're in. It's according on what family you're in. His message was a message of hope. It was a message of deliverance for God's people. But for the enemies of the Lord, there was judgment coming. Sin would be judged. Their evil actions and wickedness would be judged. So he has a message of hope for the people of God. And he has a message of judgment for the enemies of God. There will be deliverance. There will be holiness. There will be possession. Jacob possessing their possessions. Saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. Mount of Esau, you know, Jacob and Esau were brothers. Scripture says, Jacob I love, Esau have I hated. God hates no one individually, but it's according, there again, on who's, which way you choose. Some people, it seems like God hates them. God does not hate anyone. It's that you're making the wrong choice. And you're going against the Holy God, and that's why it seems like that God is hating you, that God's against you, that He's punishing you. It's... It's all because of the decisions that we make. The kingdom is the Lord's. Yes. yes, Obadiah, the servant of the Lord, he brings a message of deliverance. Deliverance speaks of salvation. There shall be deliverance. Jesus said, he told those guys in Luke chapter 10 that they were rejoicing. He said, I send you forth with power over all the power of the enemy. I want you to go and preach the kingdom of God. I want you to cast out devils and heal the sick. I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And they rejoice. They said, even the spirits are subject unto us through your name. And he says, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Those of us who have received Christ as Savior and serve Him as Lord 
And we have our name written in the Lamb's book of life. We have something to rejoice about. We have something that the world cannot take away from us. God has promised deliverance for His people. And He will deliver His people. I know that there's a lot of people right now that like that song said that there's upset. They're upset because the news comes, hey, we may not have enough money to give you your social security check. Well, if you'd have kept your cotton picking hand out of the cookie jar, you'd have had enough money to give uh, the social security check. You know, we were brought up not to steal anything that didn't belong to you. Don't take it. And if you use something, put it back where you got it. So if you take, if you need something and you borrow it, take it, put it back in there and put a little bit of interest on it. Then that'd help us all out. We would have, we would have got a raise the last two years. I'm talking about deliverance now. Do you know what? Old Tony boy is not trusting in the Social Security check. I'm not trusting in my disability check. It's good to have. We need it to live. But I'm not trusting in that. I'm trusting in the living God. God said, I will take care of you. He said, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And uh, the Bible said, I've been young and now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Amen. I am trusting in the living God. God will take care of me. He's promised that He will never leave me nor forsake me. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man can do unto me. Take my check. You can take my house. You can take my car, but you can't take my joy. Gas keeps going up. They don't have to take it. It will be parked in the the driveway. Can you see me and Sister Peggy riding on the old mule come trying to get to church? Man. Bicycle built for two. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer true. <laughs> me and Miss Peggy is going to ride on a mule built for two. Well, God says I will deliver you. Deliverance upon Mount Zion. This special mountain of the Lord, but it speaks of the church. It speaks of the spiritual highness of God. Upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. You have salvation. You have a treasure that nobody can take away from you. You have a treasure that is not bought by silver and gold, that is not affected by the economy or the government. You have salvation in Jesus Christ And that's all you need to get you from here to earth to glory. Holiness speaks of sanctification. Upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. It looks like sometimes, man, this thing of holiness is just old Tommy Rock, you know, it's just old Tommy, it's just gone out of style. It may be gone out of style in this new age movement, in the generation that we live. But if I read the end of the story... Looks like to me, holiness is like wide ties. Holiness is like wide ties. They're going, they're coming back in, brother. All you got to do is just hook them in the rack, keep them in the closet for a little while, and then they're going to come back out. You know, wide ties are neat. They cover up your chest. If you have a spot on your shirt you can't see, it, just put a wide tie on. Somebody don't do like you ought to. It's big enough to choke them to death with it. You know, I mean, it's good for something. I always said about ties, you know, I'd like to see the first guy who ever invented one, who ever started wearing it, put one around his neck and pull it real tight and choke him a little bit with it. <laughs> Holiness is, is coming back in. Oh, it's not even gone out of style for us yet, but I'm talking about for the world, the church in general, holiness is coming back. For the Bible said there will be deliverance and there shall be holiness. The Scripture still says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. God is a holy God. He is a righteous God. He is a holy God. He demands holiness. He demands purity. God will see to it that His people will be blessed That holiness will be the rule of His government and kingdom. And He says, Jacob shall possess His possessions. We think about this thing of deliverance and a spiritual application. Deliverance speaks of salvation. Holiness speaks of sanctification. It's so hard sometimes to get people to the point where they see their need of a Savior to be saved. 
And then for those who are saved, they see their need of crucifying the old man, taking care of the sin nature, kicking the old man Ishmael out of the house, and taking care of that old man, putting the old man to death, and live a sanctified and holy life. You shouldn't have to go to school for six months or in a big class to make it happen. It's something that happens by faith. You see your need. You know the struggle that's going on. And I don't care what age you are, old or young, Jesus can sanctify you. His blood can sanctify you and cleanse you from within. Break the power of sin over your life. And you can live a sanctified life. There will be deliverance. There will be holiness. Possess. That speaks of the Spirit's Fullness and power. God wants us to live a successful Christian life. He wants us to live a victorious Christian life. You know, we're not waiting on what society is going to do. We're not waiting on what the economy is going to do to see how our spiritual life is going to pan out and to measure it by that. It has nothing to do with that. We are not measuring ourselves by the things and circumstances around us. Our hope is built on nothing less than but Jesus' blood and righteousness. We are trusting in Him. He, the Spirit, power, His God's Spirit can change. He can move in the midst of a situation. No matter how bleak it looks, no matter how hopeless it seems, God's power can move in. He said, Jacob will possess their possessions. You know, there's uh, both a spiritual and literal application. Israel will triumph over all their enemies and will possess and dwell in their own land forever. I don't care what the UN says about it. I don't care what the world says about it. I don't care what the Arabs, what the enemies of Israel say about it. Israel will possess their possessions. God sees to it, He is going to see to it, that the land that He swore to Abraham and his descendants, He said, I will give you that land and nobody can take it away from you. It belongs to them this day and they will possess it. They will dwell in their own land forever. We as believers are saved and should be sanctified and spirit-filled so that we too will enjoy the fullness and blessings of God's kingdom forever. Just like God promised Israel that land, He's promised us a kingdom. And you know what Jesus said? My little flock, don't be afraid. He said, it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I have a kingdom that's prepared for you. It doesn't depend on what the government's going to give you on the third. It doesn't depend on what the kings or the presidents say. I have a kingdom that's set up for you that's laid up there. Streets are gold and walls of jasper. And I have a kingdom that will rule this world forever. God has always had a way to prepare for His people. Not only in heaven when we get there, but He prepares and provides for us now. The kingdom is the Lord's. It belongs to Him. You know that widow, she went in there and she said, you know what, I thought I had taken all that meal out of that barrel. But she looked in there and there's always a little bit more. She looked in there and there's always a little more. Every time she went to the barrel, it had enough meal. Every time she went to there, the cruise of oil had a little bit left in it. God always has what you need. He always has enough. He may not give you everything you want, but He'll supply your needs. I have a God that will supply all of my needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God will take care of me. The Scripture still says, Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and Thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. Psalms 145 verse 13. The kingdom belongs to God. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. That's when He comes out of heaven, riding on that white horse. He has that name upon His thigh. Written, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Glory to God. That's the one I serve. That's the one I answer to. I try to be a good boy and a good citizen. And I try to pray for those in authority over me. And I try to do the best I can to obey them as long as their law doesn't conflict with the God I serve. But when their law conflicts with God's law, then I must obey God rather than man. But we try to be quiet and live a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And we pray for those in authority over us. But you know, they're not the King. They're not the real authority. God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, that's the real authority. That's the real King. 
And it's not the Allah God. It's not the Joseph Smith God. It's not the other false God who's dead in the tomb. It's the living God, Jehovah. That's the God that we serve. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. It's not going to pass away. There is no election. God elected Him, and He's there forever. God said, You are My Son. This day have I begotten You. I will give you the ends of the earth for your possession. God has already established Him King forever. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government will be on His shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. There's none like Him. He is King and He is Lord. Bless His holy name. The preceding message has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries. 